The train wreck in East Palestine, Ohio, sent toxic chemicals into the air and water. And for residents of this small Ohio community, the cleanup is just the beginning. But the political fallout, equally toxic, is only getting worse. And it has come to represent all that is wrong with American political discourse today. Well, you're in luck because our Friday nightcap is here to discuss all of it. Mara Escampo, anchor and managing editor of Revolt Black News. B.D. Wong, who I'm a super fan of, actor and director of the upcoming show, Yes, I Can Say That, by another nightcap fave, Judy Gold. Ron and Sana is here. My dear friend, CNBC senior analyst, and George M. Johnson, author of All Boys Aren't Blue and We Are Not Broken. We got a lot to cover. Mara, I turn to you first because I don't even know what to do with this. We are seeing Donald Trump and Republicans attack, attack President Biden, saying he's not helping East Palestine because it is a rural white community. He would do so much more if it was an urban black community. That's not even true. Yeah, and we're also having some people point out the fact that Trump had a hand in deregulating a lot of this. So as the investigation proceeds, there are questions about what went wrong and ultimately who's responsible and who's accountable. So politics does play a big role in this. We saw Pete Buttigieg being criticized for not showing up earlier. I think that's a fair criticism. I think that when something like this happens, you do want to show the community that it's a priority for you and that you care about them. But when it comes to accountability, which I think is a big part of this conversation right now, as it should be, when we're investigating what went wrong and what happened and who's ultimately accountable, the question when it comes to accountability is what kind of accountability will count? Because in cases like this, where you have these big companies, at the end of the day, they're going to be hit with a fine or with a civil settlement that is going to be small money to them. It's a rounding error. They this spend company, more money lobbying yes. than they will on fines. Absolutely. And for some of them, they build these fines into their budget. It's a line item. And so when you're talking about accountability, what can you implement that's going to actually matter. People are asking for criminal charges, potentially, if there are signs of criminal negligence. And so I think that's a bigger conversation to be had because regulations are one thing, but they only really matter if they have teeth. And if it's a you know drop in the bucket, then people will just keep doing what they're doing. Or these fines get covered by insurance companies. Take us back to this, Ron, because again, a wider audience is hearing people like Donald Trump say, Joe Biden isn't showing up. He's not helping the American people. Remind our audience of what the Trump administration did deregulation wise that put us in this risky position. And it's not just the Trump administration itself. Norfolk Southern, which, of course, is the rail line in question here, lobbied aggressively to make sure that certain restrictions on railroads, particularly freight railroads, were rolled back. That is their core business. And ProPublica did a fabulous job outlining the fact that Norfolk Southern itself had internal suggestions that would override existing security concerns and allow engineers and conductors to bypass concerns while a train was in motion. And if you saw any video of this train with flames coming out from underneath it, they ignored some of the warning signs that exist. So this is a multi-level problem that goes back to originally deregulation during the Trump era, when, by the way, we had thousands of train issues. No one visited any locations during that period when these things happened. And now blaming Pete Buttigieg or blaming Joe Biden is extremely convenient because it happened while they were in office, but has nothing to do with the root cause. Joe Biden also, by the way, was in Ukraine when he was being criticized for not going to East Palestine, Ohio, where there's a major global conflict going on. So what Ron and Mara just did was something novel. They told the truth. They told the truth to every person watching tonight. But there are millions of people who aren't watching. What do we do with that, George? The fact that, that I go back to Donald Trump telling people, well, Biden want to help a poor white community. That's just not true. But lots of people think it is. Yeah. And I mean, it's nefarious. I mean, it's like, did Flint not also happen in the United States? Sure like, did. We're in a, in, a, in a poor black community. Um, I think what we have to do is, one, media bias is just a problem across the board. Um, I think we have to sit at tables like this and just be truth tellers. And we, unfortunately, is it going to go on um, certain ears who don't want to listen to the truth? Of course. Um, is it easy to try and make an incident like this a political battle of, again, like, oh, they didn't show up here and look, look, look what they're not doing? Yeah, of course it is. But at the end of the day, we are just watching American citizens who are struggling, who are having a very traumatic event happen to them. And at the end of the day, this cannot continue to be a politicized issue. It just has to be an issue where the work gets done. Um, we have watched Republicans and Democrats battle on both sides of the aisle. And I think 
at this point, most Americans are just tired. They're just tired of hearing the rhetoric. They're tired of the, the fingers being pointed. They're tired of the fact that, like, yeah, Trump goes down there and it's like, OK, like, we literally know you deregulated this stuff. Like, it's so easy to call out. Like, part of part and parcel of the problem of this happening is because of something that you did. And so to point the finger at the other side, and then the other side's like, oh, but we're, we're doing this and we're doing that. Look at us drinking the water with them. It's all <laughs> political fodder at some point. And it's just like, what are we going to do to actually sit here, tell the truth, and actually just get the work done at some point? Stephanie, if I may, at, you know, at the ground level, there should be an Aaron Brockovich moment here yes. somewhere. She's where, there right now. Yeah, and, and <laughs> Alan Shaw, who is the CEO of Norfolk Southern, said the water is safe and he would let his kids drink it. Well, he should go live there for a year and have his family drink the water and live in the community that just was, in fact, in, you know, Wisconsin, in this issue where at least some reports are suggesting 43,000 animals have died within five miles of the event. So if it's that safe, you wouldn't have 43,000 animals dropping dead of toxic exposure. So I think there has to be a multi-layered approach to remediating these problems, starting on the ground and then working all the way back towards the regulatory environment. But what's happened in America, BD? Because when horrible disasters, when accidents, when tragedies would happen, that used to bring people. It used to bring humanity together. Yet somehow this is highly politicized yeah. when people's lives and livelihoods are at risk. People who don't care about politics, they just want to drink clean water. Well, I don't know exactly how that happened, but here we are. It's like uh, the, the difference between uh, a, a people listening to each other and responding to something uh, in a real way, direct way, and uh, having the agenda or the, 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 the need to, to achieve something based upon their actions. And to me, it's all so much performance and so much uh, people be acting in a way to elicit a response from their constituents so that they can continue to be popular with them or, or whatever that is. And I, I find that so sad and... and um, uh, Confusing, actually. I don't think I, I mean, it's, it's, it's not at all related to actually solving the problem. But we say we have to get better. We have to do the work. When are we going to do that? Right. If you think this is bad, something that should bring us together. Wait until we see Tucker Carlson release mm. some of the 44,000 hey. hours of video he personally received from the Speaker of the House. Wait until you see how toxic and divided we are then. Yeah, well, that's going to be especially dangerous because having had access to that footage is going to legitimize whatever he comes out with. Not to say that his findings will be legitimate, but he will have the cover of saying, well, I have screened all this material. I've seen these hours and hours of footage, and I can tell you that this is the case. And that is incredibly dangerous. You know, if we're talking about the video that Tucker Carlson has access to, this is tied to the January 6th interaction, insurrection. So Speaker McCarthy is now providing him with all of it. This is video that we should remind people that the House panel investigating January 6th, the House committee investigating January 6th, had to negotiate with the Capitol Police about how to get access to it and sit in a locked room to review it. And now Tucker Carlson is going to have unfettered access to it. Just because January 6th didn't succeed on January 6th doesn't mean that that type of thing couldn't succeed again in the future. We're at a very dangerous, precarious time, and it seems to only be getting more divided, more polarized, um, and more dangerous. You have Marjorie Taylor Greene now calling for a, a national divorce, which is, you know, a cute euphemism for a civil war. Um, so it's a really, really dangerous time. And at the root of it is what you're speaking to with what we're seeing happening in Ohio is just this polarization and this politicization about everything, even human tragedy. But didn't we think the midterms was a clue to Washington, D.C. that said America is done with this? Let's get to work. You're talking about doing the work. And, and that's what the midterms asked for. Yeah. But it's not what we're delivering, at least not what our lawmakers are. No. Um, unfortunately, one thing I've learned is that, um, especially with white people in power, they would rather burn everything down yeah. than before they would. I mean, it just is what it is, right? Like they would literally they could watch themselves lose watch themselves, like, make decisions that are against this country, but for the sake of power would continue to just torch everything, so um, including themselves. Literally, they were willing to die um, and also claim that they're oppressed. So it's like a very, it's like a very interesting thing that's happening. Again, like, even when you hear, like you said, the, the message of Trump saying, like, oh, this is a rural white town, it's like, white people in this country specifically are so dead set on wanting to be oppressed. It is the one thing Some that they cannot people, be. Not, not all. Not all, right? not all. But I mean, but even still, right? Like 
all white people will benefit from it, right? And so, like, but they're so dead set on trying to prove that there is an oppression that is happening, that it becomes this political issue. That's how January 6th happened. There was a group of people who literally rioted because they felt they were oppressed and didn't realize the richest people in this country are probably their cousins. But they rioted <laughs> so, also because they were told lies the, over absolutely. and over and, and over. And it's clear that's not changing. No, and the, and the risk with respect to the footage from January 6th is multifold. Number one, you're giving away security camera footage that would allow something like January 6th to go farther than it did. Number two, every media outlet, every news outlet should have equal access to that information if indeed it's being released by the government. And you cannot do selective release. Now, Everything's been leaked to selective organizations over time. But when you have something that important, that broad, that deep, it should not be handed to one individual, particularly the individual it's being handed to, who has a long, long history of lying directly to his audience, as do the other two or three members of their primetime lineup. This is something that uh, we should all have access to and be able to vet on our own. But to me, it's not just about Tucker Carlson. It, to me, it's about Kevin McCarthy sure. and about Absolutely. how he has on his list of privileges this ability to uh, give this, uh, give all of this footage to Tucker Carlson or whoever he gives it to. It, it, that that kind of He's blows my mind. He's classifying it's, it's, it for all intents and purposes. Yeah. Yes, and it's also about what you're talking about, which is the uh, playing dirty thing. Yeah. They'll do. He'll do. He doesn't care how it looks or what it, the ramifications are, or how ethical or unethical it seems. He's just going to do what. But, but he wants his outcome to, to, to serve his outcome. But it also speaks to how weak he is politically. I mean, this is the weakest speaker in modern political history. So I think we're going to see a lot more actions like this because he has to do whatever he has to do to appeal to the far right of the party yeah. because it only takes one to call for a vote to remove him from office. Yeah. I mean, that's an incredibly weak position to be in. It is. But right now, he has a very strong hand in just the fact that he is the Speaker of the House. None of us are. And he's handing this footage yes. over to one single individual. And in all of this, I do want to remind our audience what this original story was about, the residents of East Palestine. These are people who just want to know if it's safe to drink the water, that they and their kids have a future. It is what all of us want. It is only February, and already state lawmakers across this country have introduced over 300 anti-LGBTQ bills. They range from bathroom bans to Tennessee leading the way on a bill to ban drag shows on public property. Well, our nightcap is still here, George. You know I'm turning to you first. <laughs> Your book, Our Boys Aren't Blue, has been under attack for years. Yes. What do you think about this onslaught of bills? I mean, drag shows, who even cares that much? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we have to get to the reality of the situation. A census came out, uh, I believe it was the 2019 or 2020 census, and it basically said that Generation Z uh, was about to be more non-white than white and was already identifying as 20% LGBTQ. And so when we look at what is happening, the book bans, we look at Roe v. Wade, when we look at Don't Say Gay Bills, they are all tied together. This one census that is showing that the demographic in this country is changing so rapidly is the reason that all of these anti-LGBTQ bills are coming out. It is the reason why they are trying to force white women in particular to have more children. Uh, it, it all goes hand in hand. They need, one, they want to keep the heteronormative uh, paradigm of this country intact. Too Two, late. they want to keep white men in power. <laughs> um, and three, uh, all of this, like I said, it, it just goes back to um, where this country has always started. This country has always oppressed people who uh, were non-white. This country has always oppressed people who were not heterosexual. Um, as those dynamics are starting to shift rapidly with Gen Z, as they are my favorite generation because they are ready for war at all times, um, we are watching the pushback primarily uh, be against them. And uh, I just happen to get caught up in, in the flow because I just happen to write a little book about my story about a being black book. and queer. <laughs> okay, okay, then given where we are in the culture wars, I'm guessing your MVP this week has got to be somebody in this mix. Yes. Uh, my MVP this week is a good friend of mine. Uh, her name is Hope Giselle. She is a black trans woman who is an author. She is an activist. She is a DEI specialist, and she is the first openly black trans woman to speak uh, at NASA. 
Uh, she is doing the work to create safer spaces for black LGBTQ people. Um, she has always been about it. She has been um, someone who has protected me at times and has spoken up on behalf of my book at times. Um, and she's just a brilliant, brilliant black woman who I think deserves all of her flowers now and deserves to be booked across this country because she is just amazing, fabulous, and she, she's just about it. She is the moment. Didi, how about you? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm going to hop on the, the drag visibility wagon because, well, actually. <laughs> what a wagon. Actually, <laughs> it's a fabulous wagon. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the, um, I actually was like, it's actually Broadway that I'm really into this week. I'm a proud member of the Broadway community. And, I'm o and we're, Broadway always wins on this show, just yes, so okay, you know. Great, always great. wins. Well, Jinx Monsoon, a, a really an incredibly talented and very visible drag performer, has taken over a role in Chicago and broken all box office records. Chicago has been running for like 20 years mm -hmm. or more than that. And, and so for someone to come in and, and not only breathe fresh artistic life into a show, but to create that uh, visibility, which we absolutely need to counteract all of this uh, transphobia and drag phobia is is really important. But also, I wanted to throw a shout out to the cast of Parade, the, uh, yes. the musical, yes. which is yes. having uh, incredible anti-Semitic protests uh, based upon the content of the show and how the cast and the, the, the production and the theater and the uh, New York City Center who uh, are uh, producing the show have stepped up and spoken out against it. I, I think there's some kind of day of hate mm -hmm. that is being um, uh, organized. I mean, have you ever heard of such a thing? A no, but it's being combated with a day of love and That's support right. for the yes. Jewish community this weekend. Who's your MVP, Mark? My MVP is Rihanna. And okay, always. Not, always. It's not even this week. She's the MVP always. of every week, and yes. it's not because of the Super Bowl performance, though that could have earned her, earned her a spot as well. hundred feet off the ground, and, pregnant, and pregnant is pretty amazing. impressive. Amazing. Yeah. Um, it's because of her Vogue cover. So she was on the cover of British Vogue, and the photo is of her in front of her husband, leading, you know, he's behind her. ASAP he's, behind ASAP her Rocky, with the or, baby. I'm sorry, not her husband. Her I got man, way ahead partner, of myself. I'm partner, so excited about a potential partner. wedding. Her partner. <laughs> um, and she is in front of him, and she's leading him, and he's holding the baby, and the baby is smiling, and the baby looks so happy. And, you know, the cover really triggered a lot of misogynists because she has this very, you know, bold, confident pose. She's leading the man. She looks like she's in charge. But I saw something completely different. I saw a family unit that really supports one another. Um, I saw a woman who is running a business and she's learning how to juggle and manage a family. I saw two partners who were learning how to, who's, everybody can't lead at the same You're time. You're giving me the chills. It was amazing. But the best thing that I saw was the happy baby. That mm -hmm. boy's mm -hmm. smile could light up a room. And that tells you everything you need to know about the house he's growing up. Misogynist be damned. Ron, <laughs> yep. take us home. I'm going with Vladimir Zelensky because oh. one year after the invasion of Ukraine. To this day. Talk about a transformational character in so many different ways. A, a comic actor who becomes the president of a country after having played the president of a country on TV mm -hmm. and then turning out effectively to be a hero for his nation. I, it, it's just, it's such a transformative moment, I think, for them. It, it tells us a lot about what can be done, what individuals can do, what one person can do to change and bend the arc of history. I don't see how um, he can't be considered a hero. And he's gotten a lot of great support from Joe Biden and from those in Europe. But I think he stands head and shoulders above many other leaders right now with respect to what he's been able to do in the last year. Those are heroes across the board. I'm going to wrap up with an MVP that is not a hero, but certainly had an extraordinary week. We talked about it in our last segment, and it is Tucker Carlson. It cannot go unnoticed that Kevin McCarthy, the Speaker of the House, is now working hand in hand with a known propagandist. Now, thanks to Kevin McCarthy, Tucker Carlson has 44,000 hours of sensitive government security camera video footage from January 6th. What he does with it and the effect it could have, we do not know. But congrats, Tucker Carlson. You won the week. Wake up, America. This is happening on our watch.